Good evening. My name is Malcolm Clemens Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral here in San Francisco, California. Welcome to the forum and thanks for joining us online. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, the United States government interned 120,000 people of Japanese descent living in the mainland, while this much larger concentration of Japanese in the Hawaiian Islands were not similarly incarcerated. Tom Kaufman is a political journalist and a leading historian of modern Hawaii. Author of six books and director of six documentary films, his latest book is Inclusion, How Hawaii Protected Japanese Americans from Mass Internment, Transformed Itself, and Changed America. In making sense of the disparity between Hawaii and the mainland, Inclusion unravels the deep history of the U.S. sabotage psychosis, the causes of the internment, and the special set of forces in Hawaii that preserved its interracial harmony throughout the depths of the war. Each year, the cathedral chooses a theme for inspiration and reflection, and in 2022, our theme is connection. Tonight, we'll be marking Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month with a conversation about inclusion and how small groups with a common goal and working cooperatively can result in wondrous social change. Um, I want to also introduce my wife, Heidi, who's joining us for the conversation. Um, Tom, it's such a blessing to have you here. We're, I'm so grateful for you for agreeing to talk with me tonight. Um, your book, Inclusion, um, I read I read scores and scores of books about Hawaii, history, but botany, mm -hmm. um, pretty much anything you can imagine, music. Um, and this was one of the most powerful books I've read about Hawaii. Um, congratulations on such a carefully researched work. Thank you very much. And it's nice to be here. You know, as I was reading, I was thinking um, there were um, Japanese Americans in Hawaii were about 37% of the population. And in the West Coast of America, they were much smaller share of the, of the population, but were interned in massive numbers. And I wonder if you can just give us the explanation for why the experience in Seattle or Los Angeles or San Francisco was so different than Honolulu or Wailuku or Lihue or what have you. Well, the numbers are are stunning. Um, the thirty seven percent in Hawaii number is, as you said, and when you say a small number in the West Coast states, it was between one and two percent, depending on where you were. Mm -hmm. So it was a widely scattered population that was a really small part of the total population. Um, nonetheless, it was perceived as uh, this great security threat uh, emanating from uh, scare stories that were originated from Hawaii uh, by, first of all, by the Secretary of Navy of the Navy who arrived uh, the week after the bombing and announced that this was sabotage on a uh, almost unparalleled scale. scale. It was uh, the worst since he had, uh, since, since the uh, uh, sabotage in Norway when the Germans invaded Norway. Uh, if you can imagine how inflammatory that was. And uh, from his original scare statement, um, the story mushroomed across the United States and around the West Coast, particularly where there was a uh, fear of an invasion. And, uh, and it reached, you know, uh, very receptive ears in Washington, DC. People in Washington, DC, uh, starting with the president and with the intelligence agencies who had looked at Hawaii's Japanese American population for years with skepticism uh, as to their loyalty. In Hawaii, by contrast, there was a great deal of community organization and communication, positive communication basically, um, in which rumors were investigated and dispelled um, and um, the assurances were given from the top level authorities in Hawaii to the Japanese community 
to the effect that um, we want to uh, involve you in the war effort. We do, are not going to run out and do any kind of mass evacuation and uh, incarceration. And it set in motion a, an entirely different uh, dynamic. It set in motion a dynamic, um, by and large, this is you know not a perfect process, as you can imagine, such an anxiety-laden time, but it set in motion a, a substantially trusting process. And so it was almost a night and day difference in which paradoxically, the fear of sabotage took hold of the mainland population when it was disbelieved on the ground, on the site of the attack in Oahu. Right, right. so in, on, in Oahu, for instance, people are not worried about sabotage. And in, in, even though the, the, the attack happened on Pearl Harbor and people who are in Seattle are worried about sabotage, even though no Japanese forces have moved further east than Hawaii. That's, it's such an interesting thing. I, I, I wonder too, um, um, I, I, my family, ha- actually my great, great grandfather was interned in World War I in Berlin. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the history of just like internment camps in, in modern warfare. I, I mean, I wonder what you know about that. You, you may, may have done a little bit of research in order to understand the context of this particular situation. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, uh, but I can speak to it uh, at a modest level. And that is um, that, you know, internment, uh, while it makes everyone's, you know, hair stand up on the back of their neck, uh, internment does logically arise, the subject logically arises if there is a large population derived from the country of origin that you're fighting with, right? Right, right. And so, you know, I think part of the discussion of inclusion, meaning in a general sense, not just my book sense, does need to deal with a rational discussion of internment or some kind of method of of, uh, intelligence gathering and surveilling in wartime and, uh, you know, like supervised parole of of actually like a very few people. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, that was interesting to me too, that the people in the Hongwanji missions were especially yeah. suspect people who'd gone back to Japan, Japan for language study, et cetera, were, were right. especially under scrutiny. So people who were uh, close to Japan or, or sent from Japan as teachers, as missionaries to temples uh, or as, uh, uh, you know, for Shinto temples, which were very much identified with Japanese militarism. Yeah. Um, and a certain number of Japanese language journalists, most of whom were Japanese American, um, and uh, a, a number of Japanese businessmen who did a lot of things like import export. And so this amounted to, um, in the in the first round of right after the uh, bombing, about four to 500 people being picked up and uh, detained. And that is uh, uh, in contrast to several thousand on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, so the, the dynamic had been because the, you know, the FBI and Naval Intelligence, Army Intelligence, so on, had been studying this community, okay, Um, in a way that today would, you know, make us very uneasy. Um, And the, but there were arrest lists and the the, uh, process was of increasing confidence in the, either the loyalty of Japanese Americans or, 
the uh, harmlessness of their alien uh, parents. And so the, uh, the number of, of people on the arrest list was shrinking. Yeah, I think it's so interesting that that, that um, a key number of leaders in Hawaii um, did the research and realized that this wasn't a threat. I mean, you know, Heidi, I, I, I've never asked. Oh, do you have I was going to ask, yeah. yeah. Um, what about, you know, a lot of uh, Japanese in Hawaii at the time were also migrant workers, you know, who had come over for sugar. Um, was that uh, at all? And, you know, also, I know the camps are only on Oahu. at the, So did anybody come from the outer islands to those camps as well? Those are my questions. Oh, okay. Uh, the answer is um, that they did come from the outer islands. Uh, there were camps on uh, all five of the major populated islands. Um, small numbers from neighbor islands by and large. Um, and um, many came from Oahu because a disproportionate number came from Oahu because you're not really mostly talking about plantation workers at all, but about members of a intellectual, religious, or business elite. Yeah, that it was that was one of the things that was interesting to me too. Is just um, that it was it was class based in a way. I mean, they weren't con concerned about people who were cutting cane in the fields. They were concerned about journalists, um, for instance. Yeah, right. I wonder, Heidi, if you might, did, did your, um, Heidi's um, Auntie Komatsu, um, her, her grandma June, um, that Japanese okay. side of the family, what did they say about the World War um, II internment times? What did they say about what it was well, like to be none, alive? None, none of my family at that point was interned. They're all in Maui, um, the Fujiyama family. But um, my uncle Takeo was in the 100th Battalion, and he actually joined um, before, right before Pearl Harbor had been bombed, um, but it was killed in Italy. Yeah, so their their connection with that, um, they had one other brother, and he did not go in, into the um, to the four forty second or in, in any kind of way. They kept him home, but yeah, they um, they always talked about just that part of the war was the loss of Uncle Takeo. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that too, Tom. I mean, just the number of people who volunteered to fight in these special regiments, and you know what their experience is like, and and how they're remembered. Okay, the uh, Uncle Takeo in this conversation was uh, particularly in a remarkable group because he actually had been drafted if he was mm -hmm. the 100th. Uh, the draft opened up in 1939. It was the first peacetime draft and it was in uh, anticipation of a war. And um, the you know, we, we don't think of this this way today at all, but minorities in, in the United States generally were very apprehensive, not of being drafted, but of being left out and, of, and essentially being pariah populations, um, populations that were further marginalized by not being in military service. So, the inclusion in the draft resulted from an amendment that was uh, uh, lobbied by the NAACP primarily, wow. uh, which said in the draft, you cannot, dis cannot exclude by uh, religion, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, and that applied to Hawaii as well. And so suddenly, about 2,000 uh, young men were drafted in 1939, 1940, 1941, there were several waves, um, and trained, uh, armed and tra uh, trained in combat uh, and stationed at Schofield Barracks. And uh, they were the first persons, the first unit it was a unit of about 1,300 Hawaii men to be shipped to mainland training camps and eventually to be shipped to Europe for combat. And it resulted from uh, a, an agreement that is a, a, a great paradox. That was the architect 
the person who's widely regarded in Japanese America today as the inner architect of the mass internment removal of mainland Japanese Americans, John J. McCloy, who was Under Secretary of War, stopped over, stopped over from uh, Washington, D.C., stopped over on the West Coast, met with various people, gave a go-ahead based on President Roosevelt's uh, work for the mass evacuation from the West Coast and then flew to Hawaii and was surrounded by people who vouched for the loyalty and value and worth of all the Japanese Americans he met there. And he did a 180 within days. He realized that he had it wrong and he conspired with the martial law governor of Hawaii to organize this unit that your uncle was in mm -hmm. and send them off to for training, uh, even when there wasn't any clear agreement within the War Department or the president uh, as to what would happen next. Mm -hmm. But they distinguished themselves in training and then in battle. Um, in extraordinary ways. And uh, it opened the door to the much larger and more famous unit. Uh, a, lot, a lot more people are familiar with the 442nd, it's called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which was a unit of um, at least three times that size. Um, and that really opened things up and turned things around because they were an all volunteer unit. Uh, two thirds were from Hawaii. Uh, people, 10,000 young men from Hawaii volunteered. Um, and um, so there wasn't room for all of them in the first wave by any means, uh, but they formed this much larger outfit and they distinguished themselves in battle uh, in extraordinary ways. They really rose to the top of the American combat forces in the first the Italian theater and the, um, the French theater and then returning to the Italian theater, breaking the German lines uh, leading to the surrender of Germany. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think is so interesting in the in your book is you talk about just kind of like the role of of Japanese officers. So, uh, so as a, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, just like kind of upward mobility in the army for people of color. Um, that story. Okay, there's there's layers and layers, but yeah, the, the, everything's complicated. The, the, the seminal layers are always the most interesting, right? Because, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Hawaii, as part of uh, army people on the ground in Hawaii, were always much more favorable to most mostly were more favorable to Japanese Americans than the War Department by far. Yeah. And as a feature of that, they started ROTC in the high schools. In 1923, I, I was in JROTC. <laughs> <laughs> that that fits. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so there were, you know, hundreds and hundreds of young men who were, you know, introduced to military training, and um, then went on to ROTC at the University of Hawaii. And would do you know like two week summer camps and and uh, all of that and some of them became officers in the hundredth battalion immediately and then some additionally became officers in the four forty second initially uh, but by and large because of this war department distrust and this essentially racialized system right yeah. Uh, white officers were imposed 
um, at, and the, in the higher reaches. But as battles went on, and, and you know, battlefield deaths went on, uh, increasingly, um, Japanese Americans exerted a higher and higher level of leadership until finally um, one was a commander of the 100th Battalion. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I came on the scene um, and I, I guess I saw some of the vestiges of just like this incredible like Japanese culture in Oahu. I think like of Kuakini Hospital, like volunteer associations, religious organizations. Um, one of the things I, I, I am interested in is if you could talk a little bit about the situation for Japanese Americans or people of Japanese ancestry in Hawaii in the 20s. And, and then what it was like for people of Jap Japanese ancestry after World War II. Okay. Uh, what would I say about the 20s? I would say that, um, for, uh, first of all, as background, sort of between the, uh, the annexation of Hawaii mm -hmm. in 1900 and World War I, um, I'd say it was a very you know, white colonial white dominant society, um, pretty much unqualified. Um, and Japanese had, were um, only arriving in large numbers in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Um, as um, it turned the corner from World War I and in the interwar period, uh, the Japanese community was getting I think increasingly well organized mm. um, and active in uh, civic life, active in preliminarily active in politics, uh, businesses functioning, uh, some labor organizing uh, going on it was very important. And um, generally, there was a a realization, I think, on the part of the white elite that the Japanese community was there to stay. Yeah. It was not a transient community. It was, they were neither uh, coming to Hawaii and then returning to Japan, nor coming to Hawaii and then moving on to the mainland, that this sizable Japanese population um, had developed and put down roots and it was, you know, it was not without contention, but there were increasingly um, relationships and ties uh, that helped bind things together when the horrendous stress of the crisis of the bombing occurred. Yeah, you know, I, um, I, I, this is something, this is a question for both of you, actually. You know, one of the things I, I realized from your book was just, you know, how Christian organizations were involved in giving a people a sense of racial equality that is, is, a, is an important value for people to have. Um, and, you know, one of the things you talk about with the Council for Interracial Unity is just the influence that that kind of set of ideas that all people really are created equal in the eyes of God and how powerful that idea was in Hawaii and how, in a way, Hawaii was so much further ahead than the mainland in, in terms of that value. Um, and I, I, the question for the two of you is, you know, every time I go back to Hawaii, I do feel like there's a certain respect for like the religious establishment that I just don't see in the West Coast. You know, there's a deferential part of it, but there's also the part of just like family parties. There's a prayer before the family party. Like I would be surprised if I was in the mainland and somebody said, okay, we're going to, we're going to pray. Um, I wonder if, so if you could talk a little bit about just like the influence on Christianity on, on, in, on, in Hawaii and not just Christianity, I'd say religious institutions in general. Well, I, I agree with the drift of, of your question. Um, is a, um, you know, it, it, it comes from multiple directions. I think it comes from a native Hawaiian population that was deeply religious to begin with um, and which very quickly adopted uh, Christianity as the state religion of the kingdom of Hawaii in like 1832, I believe it was. Yeah. Um, and uh, the 
board of missions, um, you know, Hawaii was a very high priority uh, with the board of missions. They sent wave after wave of missionaries. Um, and then Asians came with uh, Buddhist beliefs primarily, but Confucian beliefs and Shinto beliefs. And uh, all of these mingled together into a kind of, of uh, cultural and religious climate in which um, uh, there was a certain reverence for life or uh, valuing of, of uh, life. And uh, the Christian doctrine, particularly of the equality of, of each person, uh, undermined white racism yeah. to a certain extent. It um, was in uh, inherent contradiction and inherent opposition to white racism. And uh, uh, so there was always this tension and the tension um, went very far back in time, but it was very much at work in the crisis of 1941. Probably. No, that's interesting. For example, uh, just for example, um, many of the people who were involved in the networks, which navigated the crisis, were YM, were connected to one another through the YMCA. Yeah. yeah. The Men's Christian Association. And the YMCA Christian Association was uh, reported repeatedly as being the most active Y program of any city in the United States. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, tremendous just to read all the different accounts that you describe and just how liberating that idea is. And um, just the dignity of every single human being. Um, you know, um, this is a question that either of you can chime in on too. Um, I, I think about um, kind of pre-Captain Cook Hawaii and it, just like what parts of that are left kind of in the culture that, that you, so when you think of, you know, what's what's left, what are the first things that you think of? Language. Yeah. I feel like the language um, is increasing again with our language immersion schools. And I think with language, you can understand who you are as a Hawaiian, as a person, as a native. Um, I think that also goes deep into who our, our religious being um, because like just like land acknowledgements or things like that are to being thankful. I, I think that's who we are. Um, it's in our core for water, for land. Um, and so I think definitely having our, our, our languages on a rise. It was definitely, um, we were the most literate you know, for a period of time. Um, in the 19th century. Right, um, and, and with David Malo and, um, so I think ha having that resurgence, like my generation, you know, in the eighties, we, everybody took Japanese because you wanted to work in the hotels and be able to speak Japanese. Um, but my niece and nephews, they're all like Hawaiian, like Olelo Hawaii, you know? So I think language. It's interesting too, as, as you said that, I was thinking about jurisprudence, just like the ways in which Hawaii's judicial system is different than the mainlands because of that native Hawaiian experience. What do you think of Tom when you think of just um, of, of of that culture and its uh, ongoing effect into our time? Well, I, uh, the the revival of language is the most, you know, the single most extraordinary uh, and successful aspect of it. Um, but certainly, all, really, all aspects of of Hawaiian culture are being retrieved on some level and being revived and reworked for contemporary time, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the question of the relationship between this, in essence, a suppressed nation. Right? The Hawaiian word is lahu, mm -hmm. yeah. suppressed nation of people. And what is the relationship of a suppressed nation to a, uh, what was it in essence, an invading mm -hmm. uh, nation. Right. Um, and uh, that there all remains to be 
worked out and the problems of relationship and the problem of inclusion um, it is, I think, you know, very much in the forefront of, of how we're struggling today with the relationship between the state of Hawaii, Native Hawaiian, Lahui, redevelopment, um, and in turn, the relationship to the United States. It occurs to me that Hawaii is the only state of the United States where there is an indigenous population that uh, has a tradition of nationhood as, a, as a, uh, contrasted to tribal organization. And, um, and also it is the signature culture of this place. Um, and in terms of spoken address of values, Hawaiian culture defines relationships and values uh, way disproportionate to its, you know, very sizable population. But um, it's um, it's a really vibrant, ongoing process. Um, and who knows where where it will go? It's it's uh, it's really unfathomable. Yeah, I like the fact that um, you know. Well, when you say that it comes from it derives from a nation, right? Before um, annexation, um, there was a lot of uh, in the you know eighteen hundreds, late eighteen hundreds, with like connections with even the the Japanese um, nation and Hawaii. You know, I think even arranged. A talk, a talk about arranged marriage between Princess Kaiulani and and so there was always some kind of connection. Um, but I was wanting you to kind nation, of like, nation connection. Yes, yeah. nation, national, and national, and really, um, you know, a national love kind of and a respect for each each as well. Um, and I'm thinking going back to like just the book and inclusion and how you know where we got uh, how we how we weren't um, so susceptible to like, yes, we're going to turn everyone in Hawaii. I think it also goes back to that um, love and respect of like knowing each other, you know, and I think in your book, you talk about that where when you know a person, um, it's, it's, you can understand them as well too. So if you can explain a little bit more about that. Um. Well, I write, I, I try to write about uh you know, the importance, and these are like very much Hawaiian values, but the, the importance of being outgoing, mm -hmm. the importance of active friendship, the importance of uh, communicating, the importance of, uh, you know, a sunny greeting, mm -hmm. uh, all of which adds up to what is uh, this, the, our word, your word, my word, aloha. Mm -hmm. uh, which is quite real for, uh, you know, for us. Uh, and it's, it's real, I think. It becomes real for visitors after a little while. I think they can become infected with it. Um, and uh, these types of relating to each other, uh, uh, you know, multiply and, uh, spread out and it's the basis of community mm -hmm. to a significant extent and uh, with community you're much more you're much better prepared for in this instance for a crisis uh, you're much better prepared to cope with this horrendous stress mm -hmm. that's put on people and um, I wrote about it in my book, uh, knowing that many people expect history to be dished off in terms of uh, what this powerful person said to the president and what the president, right, right. the secretary of war and what the secretary of war said to the general and the admiral and then why the person got fired and who came to replace him and how the war went. Uh, it's it 
writing from Hawaii leads me, I think, to write about community and acquaintance as a force of history, aloha as being a force of history that uh, isn't usually thought of as the, the stuff of history, but it is, you know. And I think I think I kind of kind of proved that in my my book. Okay. Yeah. It does. I I, yeah. I, I I love that. I mean, it's like my, maybe my best takeaway from this whole conversation. But you're right. I mean, it's not just about battles won here or um, generals here. It, it is like this really grassroots, like ordinary people who are, are extraordinary in in the things that they accomplish by by by, by um, meeting up with people who are of different races and and really organizing. Love wins. Love wins. <laughs> Love wins for sure. You know, I wonder if the two of you together can just kind of like explain like the overthrow of the monarchy to like everybody out there in the world. I mean, I have my own little story. It's like like little um, elevator story of it. But maybe I'd love to hear what you guys say about the overthrow. I think of the uncle's the historian. Why don't, why, don't you, why don't you do your take? First. My, for me, I wrote, my, I wrote a whole huge book about. Yeah, exactly. I know. I feel, I feel like you should probably. Uh, well, you, my my understanding has. Um, more to do with like McKinley and the um, ta- so tariffs, like ta- ta- sugar, sugar tariffs, yeah. and and American businessmen um, in Hawaii with sugar and wanting to not have to pay the tariffs, and therefore kind of imprisoning the, our queen for a year. And, and talk about a person of deep faith, you know, compose amazing oh, yeah. music and a huge prayer oh, right. for the people who are doing this to her. Um, one of the, the Queen's prayers, one of my favorite songs, and so talk about it. Um, yeah, someone who just was steadfast in who she was, but it seemed to me it was had to do with sugar and the tariffs and and that. But yeah, so 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 the the tariffs. That's my like, kind of. There was an economic reason. That's good. That's to good. Have the territory of Hawaii. <laughs> be. <laughs> okay, on on that on that uh, slice, uh, basically, it was a trade between the American elite and Hawaii, the American descendant elite in Hawaii and they were the missionaries whose children went into business because mm-hmm. the mission cut them off okay stop supporting them and they became business and then they became business tycoons and they became the, sh- the people who organized this sugar industry which spread across all the islands right as you know um, and the trade-off was the sugar industry wanted duty-free access to the United States sugar market so they could compete directly with American cane sugar. And the United States wanted Pearl Harbor as a means of projecting American military force into the Pacific. Mm-hmm. And that that's essentially what's embedded in, in all the documents and the horse trading and the coalescing of interests and so on. Okay, so that's like the big picture thing. And it, I agree with your observations, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I want to tell a personal story. Yeah, yeah, let's hear it's it. Like a life in Hawaii story. I have this very dear friend, Miley Meyer. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, you know Miley? <laughs> and I just read about her in your book. <laughs> you know, uh, um, and, and, and her sister, Miley, is a community building cultural force. Mm-hmm. And her sister, Meliana, is a community building artist. And her other sister, Manu, is a... Uh, she was at Harvard when we were there. She's, yeah. yeah. She was, you know, at Harvard. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's a small world. Manu is a brilliant scholar, right? So the... But lately, Miley's adopted the book, and uh, and uh, I, I was invited to one of her gatherings, and it was this wasn't about the book, okay? But it was it was a classic. Let us get to know one another, another plane, a gathering in another context, another level. And we were in the Iolani Palace, Mm. circle of people, about 15 people, 
And I was the old guy. And there were a lot of young people, really smart young people. And we were in the queen's room. Mm. She was imprisoned. We sat there for two hours talking about life, ourselves, relationships, history, and so on. And we sat next to the enormous quilt that she made. She she yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. It, it, was a Hawaii, it was a Hawaii thing. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what can you say about annexation? You can go on and on and on. It's basically the beginning of American overseas imperialism. It occurred in context of a war instigated by the United States government right. against uh, Spain. Right. Uh, and it got confused with the uh, crisis in Cuba, which was a Spanish colony. And it got confused with the Philippine-American War that Americans know nothing about. But we fought a war for 13 years in the Philippines as part of, uh, of uh, uh, suppressing uh, Filipino nationalism and taking over the uh, Philippines until um, 1946, yeah. um, when it finally was made an independent country. Um, and this is all a part of America's um, Colossus America spreading its dominance in the world. And Hawaii has, um, you know, I'm looking out at Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Station, which is across the mountain from Pearl Harbor. There's where the Japanese attacked our planes. There's where they attacked our ships. Um, and uh, it is an international power story of the first order. Yeah. Yeah, the two of you, that was great. That was just exactly what I wanted to hear. You know, um, one of the questions I keep asking about or thinking about is, you know, I remember so vividly stories about Heidi's family during the Hawaiian Renaissance, um, Protect Kohol Ave Ohana, um, and just like about the FBI agents like everywhere. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that was when you had like when, you're, when your family's being surveilled by the federal government. Well, yeah, I just thought people were outside the house, but um, because we're from Maui, and um, Koholave is closest to, if you go from Maui to, to there, um, a lot of people would come over and stay at our house before they would go over to Koholave, you know, illegally, because it was still being used by the Navy for bombing and stuff. So, right. so the PKO, yeah, uh, protect Koholave Ohana would, um, was, were part of that as well. My uncle Ricky and my Tarabi and those guys were all part of that. You're right in there. Yeah, and I wonder if Tom, you can talk because you you're such an expert on spying in Hawaii. I mean, I wonder just like is there absolutely nothing connected between that era of spying and the in the in the in spying in the in the thirties and forties? Well, it's the the instrument for it by and large is uh, you know the most, <laughs> probably the the biggest staff would be the FBI. Yeah, yeah. The FBI has been, act, been active off was often on throughout the 30s and then reestablished in 1939 for the sequence that I've described. Mm -hmm. And uh, since then we've had an FBI. The FBI's got a big office in Hawaii today and it's tentacles kind of spread out from that office to neighbor islands and to uh, American flag islands in the Pacific mm. um, and uh, so on. And uh, It, it's a, it's a very mixed bag, you know, um, surveillance, um, is a very ambiv ambiguous undertaking with enormous potential for abuse, right? Yeah. Uh, but it, um, on the other hand, we don't want to fly completely blind in a world of threats. Yeah. Should the should the people who uh, occupied your house and occupied the Navy bombing target, Kaho'olave, mm -hmm. 
have been surveilled? Absolutely not. You know, that was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I knew all those guys. Okay? <laughs> I grew up, I sort of grew, grew up with them and my wife, my wife did too. So we all, you, I, we were all part of their support network. Mm -hmm. um, Charles, uh, okay, wait. Uh, I've got a book you, you have to read. I have a book about the uh, landing. Mm. Uh, and I'll, I'll get you the, the, the title and how you can find it. Uh, it's a very, a very important story because the protest against the Navy brought together the crucial questions of the status of Native Hawaiians and resisting the military takeover of Hawaii on a, that level, resisting the this heinous use of an, an entire island as a bombing range right. and the destruction of the uh, the destruction of the soil, of the water base, of the uh, profile of the island, even mm -hmm. and turning of it, uh, turning it over into a, uh, a a place that's like a landmine, um, and that's what this small group who you knew, nine people initially in the first landing, I think, right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they confronted, and uh, they won. They won. It yeah. took uh, 1976 to uh, 2000 or so. Mm -hmm. It took 27 years, but Koalava is being renewed today, yeah. and it's been turned over to the state of Hawaii as a caretaker for the return of it to the Hawaiian Wahoo. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you tell us um, how many, how many um, Japanese were interned in Hawaii? I, you know, cause I know you said it was each Island had several and how long did people stay in the camps? I never ever learned. I mean, how, how long did they stay? There were, there were uh, a few a relatively lesser number of this original 500 who were basically mm -hmm. in for the entire war. The entire war. Uh, and then there were additional who were slowly, uh, additional people would be rounded up. Typically they were people who had studied in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were people who were encouraged uh, who were wives and children to go to two camps in Arkansas, Roar Camp and Jerome. And uh, they were not only encouraged, but they were pressured in some instances. And in some instances, I think there's, there is documentation that they were in essence forced. Forced. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, that was a very small number, but it was, you know, it wasn't pretty. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, Tom, one of our, our, our traditions is we take questions that get sent in to us. And so here's a, here's a question. You may have already answered a little bit of it. Um, is the difference in treatment of Japanese people in Hawaii something to, does it have something to do with the traditional Pacific Island people's view of family and community, no matter who they are? I'm not talking about the large population of white people in Hawaii now, but the native Hawaiian people. So that's just reading the, the, the question. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I think it is a sense of Ohana yeah. um, family um, and welcoming. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, you are a mixed Japanese Hawaiian ancestry, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm the complete product of sure. probably sugar in some ways because um, my, my mom's so sweet. <laughs> no, my mom's <laughs> side is, um, you know, French, uh, Native American, English, and um, Hawaiian, and then my dad's side is Hawaiian, Chinese, Japanese. So, there you go. <laughs> uh, inter intermarriage and uh, is increasingly 
a significant aspect of all of this. And like, as I used to be able to recite the fastest growing ethnic group in Hawaii is, uh, is people of mixed ancestry. Yeah. Uh, in my uh, now sprawling family, uh, we have uh, Hawaiian, Chinese, Vietnamese, um, African, Caucasian, mm -hmm. probably another one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's in four generations. So. Yeah. You know, um, one question I just must come up all the time for the two of you is, you know, Barack Obama. And what do you think, um, what effect did Hawaii have on Barack Obama? What effect did that have on the United States culture, life, polit politics, et cetera? Oh, I think Hawaii affected Barack Obama. And I mean, you can't, you can't be in Hawaii and not be affected by the aloha spirit and growing up with ohana around you and, you know, and a loving diversity and, and true um, embracing and, and inclusion and stuff. And as well as to, you know, go off and then um, he had a great education at Punahou and then go off um, and kind of, I think, spread that aloha spirit and that message. And I think that's what he tried to do in his presidency. Michelle Obama, the first lady, said, uh, to understand Barack, you have to understand Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, that's a good summary. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 100%. So what do you see as the effect? I mean, um, just just his general viewpoint or? I'm sorry, I, I don't quite get your question. Yeah, I mean, um, what, you know, do you see any particular like policies or any particular speeches or anything like that, that, that you see that in more or, or less? Or it may just may, that may be too far to too finely point. In President Obama? Yeah. Um, well, I think his, his whole presidency and his whole demeanor was about trying to bring people together and to try to create a more unified and whole nation. Um, and um, it ran through, you know, everything he did domestically. Um, you know, one of the questions I've been, I mean, I don't know if you've been to Maui lately, but I mean, the Maui that I first encountered is just gone and because sugar cane and um, pineapple, it's just, so just even the landscape is just vastly different than what I first encountered. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just what effects um, the um, sugar moving out of Hawaii is having just on the political situation and just on the culture of the islands. It's, that's a really good question. And it's, it's strangely not a question that's really dealt with much uh, or actively, uh, but it's huge because we basically changed from a plantation oriented uh, economy to um, you know, having all the sugar and pineapple disappear over a, a, a horizon of about, you know, 25, 30 years. And uh, uh, so there's a lot of struggle over what to do with the land, how to protect land when it's not being used, how to put land to uh, land and water yeah. to productive use. Uh, there's a led by, I think, inspired substantially by Native Hawaiians. There's a, a pretty vigorous back to the land movement and a movement to restore damaged land and damaged waterways to renew stream flows, for example. Um, and so it's a very complicated process, it's very important and it's ongoing. It's um, like that whole central Maui uh, plain that you're familiar with. Uh, until recently, that was the last big sugar plantation and uh, suddenly it went away. Mm -hmm. And now it looks like, it sort of looks like a waste now. It's so like a dust bowl right now. It does, now. it's a dust bowl. I think the water right parts of it too, I think you're, you're spot on. Um, you know, so much of the water was diverted back in the day for to 
you know, it really goes back to the Mahele and then the Kuliana land rights and your water rights to basically grow taro, which is grown in running water. So the water rights were so important. Um, and then diverting all of that water for sugar and for um, all the plantations. And then, you know, in the books, it used to, well, it was supposed to be that you forfeit, right? If you don't, you're not using it anymore for agriculture, forfeit, it goes right back to where it should go in the streamlands and, re, you know, bringing back the land. Um, but in the 90s, I think Hawaii voted to have um, agri um, golf courses be considered agriculture. And so if you don't forfeit it, if you substitute agriculture for agriculture. And so that's how they kept it. And that's how Kapole and Second City and all those other places were developed based upon that. So water is huge. I mean, water, you have to understand everything in Hawaii is named after like Waikiki, that water is by, right? Waikiki, Waihei, Waihole, Wai. Everything talks about the water and in Hawaiian value, the, the way you say wealth is vai vai, it's water. So everything is water. And you, that's why language, when we go back to language, being the key thing that's helping natives understand who they are, it is it is our language. Good, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, uh, one of the questions I always think about is, I mean, Heidi describes what it, you know, because her mother was born in the territory of Hawaii and Heidi was born in the state of Hawaii. <laughs> And, you know, I, I have all these images of people holding up newspaper with the headlines, statehood and that kind of thing. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about just what the issues were involved in becoming a state. And, and was it just you know, how popular was that idea? Um, and, and, and what did it feel like to become a state, you know, for, for people in Hawaii? Well... Heidi was here and I wasn't. So why don't you go first, Heidi? Oh, I, I was I was born in the state of Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas my, you know, because it's 1959, um, we became a state yeah. when I was born. Yeah, we're, we're too young. We're too young. <laughs> it was already a state. Uh, what would you say about your parents' idea of of? Uh, I think I, I I think at that point in 1959 they were teenagers. I think that at that point they were okay with being Hawaii. They thought that was great being the 50th state. Um, you know, they had a lot of years as a territory and annexation was far away. So they, it was, okay, yeah, we'll be part of this and and stuff. So I didn't think it was a, as a big of a deal as it would have been closer to annexation. Yeah, and also it's just, I'd say there, after the um, the Hawaiian Renaissance, there's well, a different right. take on what that would have meant. Right, and then the Hawaiian Renaissance movement in the 60s and, you know, and 70s for for us as well um, was a difference, but. So, so in that story, uh, the legitimacy of the state of Hawaii is under attack today. Yeah, right. Pretty widely. Yeah. And uh, that's an aspect, a huge aspect of what needs to be dealt with and resolved. Yeah. Um, so there are, you know, Hawaiian nationalists who uh, conversational references the fake state of Hawaii. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, the Hawaii's status in the, you know, as a, a, a sort of a polity, yeah, the planet is unique, really. I agree, I agree. And we are, uh, you know, uh, in, in my struggle to um, even figure out what I was writing about, <laughs> uh, what my subject was, I finally stumbled on this um, conception that Hawaii is, you know, like a unique Pacific gathering place where there's this large indigenous population, and then all these people from all over the Pacific, and we're all mixing together. Mm -hmm. And so this is like a unique community. And then there is a submerged Hawaiian nation. Yeah. And then we are the 50th state, and we are an outlier of the whole US military industrial complex. Yeah. And in a, a projection of that into the middle, central, and western Pacific. Mm -hmm. All those things are going on at once. Yeah. And to grapple with the question of what a why is, you uh, you kind of have to, you know, see it as a multi-dimensional 
matrix and kind of float up and down, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, it's been a, it's such a short time that I've been talking to you, but you've opened my eyes to so many things that I kind of had little intuitions about, and you, you helped me to see it in a really new way. As I say, I, I, falling in love with Hawaiian um, and being absolutely drawn into the Aloha spirit means so much to me. Um, it, it's it's been such a blessing to have you help, and you too, Heidi Ho. Um, <laughs> both of you clarifying some of these questions that I, that I, that just questions that I didn't even know that I had. So th- thank you so much for for this time together today. Okay. Thank you, Uncle. <laughs> hey. um, uh, our last forum of the season is on Sunday, June fifth at nine thirty a.m. It will be in person in Gresham Hall. I'll be talking to our new vice dean, Greg Kimura, about his story and his hopes for his new role. We rely on your support for the forum. Gifts of any size make a difference. You can give on gracecathedral.org or by texting THINK to 76278. 76278. Again, Tom Kaufman, thank you so much. We um, I look forward to seeing you next in person. And um, I'm going to check out the other books too so I can uh, know a little bit more about your other work. Aloha. 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 We shout out to Bess. Hi, Bess. <laughs>